From ABC News, I'm John Grimes. 29 minutes and counting at Cape Kennedy. Six men and one woman aboard the space shuttle Atlantis as the countdown continues for what is to be the second nighttime shuttle launch. At the Kennedy Space Center, Vic Ratner tells us it will be a spectacle widely seen. If you live in Florida, Alabama, Georgia, or even South Carolina, you may be able to see the shuttle lift off tonight. With clear weather all up and down the southeast coast, NASA estimates that millions of Americans should be able to see Atlantis as a brilliant white light climbing straight up into the night sky. The only other night shuttle launch was obscured by clouds. Riding the shuttle this trip are six men and one woman who were not awakened till mid-afternoon today because most of their work on this flight will be done at night. But they are now up and ready to go. Vic Rapner, ABC News at the Kennedy Space Center. And I'll have more after this. This is a live special report from AP Network News. I'm Dick Uliano. 50 seconds and counting. It's a beautiful night for the 23rd launching of the space shuttle, the second flight for the newer shuttle Atlantis, and only the second nighttime launching. In the background, you hear the voice of Hugh Harris, the voice of launch control. We are at T-minus one minute and 35 seconds and counting. A nearly full moon is hanging within view of the launch pad where Atlantis Atlantis and seven crew members are poised and ready to go. Because of this nighttime launching, people along the Atlantic coast within 450 miles of here, possibly from South Carolina to the Bahamas to Cuba, may see what's about to happen. They might see the orange-white 700-foot-long tail of flame from the space shuttle as it streaks toward space. One minute away from launching of the space shuttle Atlantis. The sound suppression water system is now armed, and pre-liftoff water will be released at the T-minus 16 second point. Brewster Shaw is the commander of this mission. He's making his second space flight. The pilot is Brian O'Connor. The mission specialists Woody Spring, Jerry Ross, and Mary Cleave. Charles Walker of McDonnell Douglas is aboard to perform an experiment. And a Mexican astronaut is also on hand, Rodolfo Neri. We're coming very close to the launching. T-minus 30 seconds. We have a goal for Auto sequence start. Challengers four redundant computers have assumed primary control. And T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero and liftoff, liftoff of the space shuttle, and it has cleared the tower. What a spectacular view as Atlantis arches up to the right with that long tail of orange white flame streaking toward the heavens with the moon hanging nearly full, providing a beautiful backdrop. away, you can feel the reverberations of those powerful solid rocket boosters in the three main engine. Atlanta's still in view now. You can see the flame. You can't see the smoke. It's a plume of long smoke that's usually visible in the daytime launches, but at night, all you can see is that fire from the solid rocket boosters. Velocity 24 feet per second. This is going to be a busy mission for the Atlantis. Besides deploying three satellites, two spacewalking astronauts will become, in a way, high-flying construction workers. In space, they'll erect a 45-foot tower from aluminum struts, and they'll also build a 12-foot pyramid. Cameras will record their every movement, and later on Earth, computers will study these pictures to test the building techniques in space. These eventually will be applied to the U.S. Space Station, which NASA hopes to begin building in the early 1990s. Speed, three good fuel cells, three engines at 104 percent. Now you're hearing in the background uh, NASA commentator Steve Nesbitt as he follows the action. Atlantis uh, racing toward orbit. It's still within view. 15 seconds away from solid rocket booster separation. Velocity 5,000 feet per second, altitude 19 nautical miles, downrange distance 20 nautical miles. 
Solid rocket booster separation is when the, the long rocket boosters that help lift the shuttle into, uh, into orbit separate. That's happening right now. There they go. Tiny explosives push them safely out of harm's way, away from the orbiter. They descend to Earth on parachute, land in the Atlantic Ocean where they're recovered for reuse. Velocity 5,700 feet per second, altitude 27 nautical miles, downrange distance 36 nautical miles. Now, besides the construction work that will go on, the shuttle is also carrying a couple of important cameras. One is called... Nominal means everything is going fine. Everything is on, uh, on schedule. Roger. Uh, it's carrying some cameras. One is called the Linhoff camera. This is a large format camera that the astronauts will aim toward drought areas of Africa. Uh, they'll look for surface indications that might reveal underground sources of water, especially in Ethiopia and Somalia. Also on board is the IMAX motion picture camera. For the first time, this IMAX camera will be outside the cabin. For people who have seen the film, the 37 film, The Dream is Alive, uh, it was shot by this IMAX camera. It provides some really spectacular pictures. The next event to, to happen, the next staging for the space shuttle as it races towards space is the uh, main engine cutoff, which happens uh, eight and a half minutes into flight. Status and mission control. If a problem should arise at this point uh, in the ascent, the, um, the commander has a choice of returning to the launch site. Uh, he can also abort his mission by performing what's called a transatlantic abort, where he would head overseas. Uh, there's also what's called abort to orbit that was performed in August of this year when Challenger lost an engine on takeoff, and it sort of limped to a lower orbit, but successfully completed his mission. So far, everything looks good for the Space Shuttle Atlantic. Standing by for negative return. Atlanta, Houston, negative return. Negative return means they're all set, ready to reach orbit, everything going fine. To the launch site uh, in the event of an abort. Looks like a smooth ride so far for the Space Shuttle Atlantis. And a very, very busy mission for the 23rd well, launching of the Space Shuttle. Is capable of reaching a transatlantic abort uh, into Marone on uh, two engines at 104% if that were to become necessary. This has been a live special report from AP Network News. I'm Dick Uliano at the Kennedy Space Center. This is the AP Radio Network. Atlantis lit up the skies over the southeast this evening with a spectacular nighttime launch. Bruce Hall reports. It was a dazzling show of light and sound as a 700-foot trail of fire followed the giant spaceship as it climbed out over the Atlantic Ocean. The shuttle appeared to arc right over the top of a nearly full moon and could be seen for a record seven and a half minutes before going out of sight. The crew of six men and one woman slept until mid-afternoon today in order to adjust their rest cycles to a mission schedule that calls for most activities during nighttime hours. The flight includes the first Mexican astronaut, Rodolfo Neri, who will oversee the launching of a Mexican satellite about six hours after launch. The astronauts will also be using a special camera to search for underground water deposits in drought-stricken Ethiopia and Somalia. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. This is Jackie Judd. The, the latest shuttle mission will come to an end as Atlantis glides home. Bob Scott of CBS radio station KNX has a report from Edwards Air Force Base in California. 
Everything continues to go well with the flight of the Atlantis. Less than 45 minutes ago, the crew fired the rockets, which started the ship on its speedy course back to Earth. This is mission control. The propulsion systems officer confirms a good burn. Atlantis will be landing two hours earlier than originally scheduled and on a paved runway and not the dry lake bed. The landing was moved up one orbit to give the crew a better position in relation to the sun. They found an earlier landing on orbit 109 would make things easier for mission commander Brewster Shaw and pilot Brian O'Connor. The change to the concrete runway was made because of the weather of the last week. A little over three quarters of an inch of rain made the normally hard dry lake bed muddy and in some cases dotted with puddles. Bob Scott for CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base, California. ago of hearing those twin sonic booms just before we heard them just before we heard them here at Edwards the shuttle is in view now the uh, the sky has had quite a few clouds today I started to tell you that it has not been crystal clear out here today there have been some high scattered clouds above 20,000 feet but there have also been some cloud banks uh, rather unusual for shuttle landing time closer to the ground but there is a good deal of sunshine the sun is coming around the clouds of course the big holes in the clouds and when that shuttle appears as it has now it still makes a really beautiful sight the shuttle is just completed as you probably could hear nasa telling you that uh, the shuttle has completed its big circle here over Edwards Air Force Base and is now going into the glide path to bring it down onto the runway. The shuttle is landing on the concrete runway today, runway 22, which is 15,000 feet long. We've had some rain here in the past few days. No rain today, though, despite those clouds. And the dry lake beds have had some water standing on them. They haven't had a chance to dry out. So the shuttle, as it comes in now, its nose pointed right Atlantis towards... Houston. On right, on center line, surface winds, 030 zero zero at 5. Atlantis Houston, 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 Houston. And as you can hear, the shuttle is in the glide slope now, looking very beautiful indeed, with the sun reflecting off the white surface of the shuttle. Control, we're one minute and seven seconds to touchdown. The shuttle coming right at us as we watch it, growing slightly larger by the moment. A very beautiful sight indeed. You never really get over what this thing looks like popping out of the sky because it's it's hard to pick up for a moment and then all of a sudden there it is. And it's looking very good. It's on its glide slope now. And because of that standing water, it will land on the concrete runway. It's 15,000 feet long, but the winds are, are not important today, and, and NASA is expecting no trouble at all with this landing. The idea, of course, is to put the nose right on the center stripe on that concrete runway. And the shuttle now just 100 feet or so above the uh, concrete runway, coming down. The wheels down and into place, and the shuttle right above the concrete surface now. A really beautiful glide. When it reaches this point, it seems to just kind of hover for a few moments. And finally, touch down. The wheels do touch down on the concrete runway, and as you're familiar with, it rolls along. 
with its nose remaining in the air for a while, for another 10 seconds or so. And finally, the nose wheel comes to rest down on the concrete runway. So Atlantis is home after a, a very busy mission indeed. the first construction mission Coming up at 4 o'clock, it's San Antonio's only three-hour afternoon newscast with Paula Carmen and Larry Haichu. At 7 p.m., you can talk with UTSA coach Don Eddy on Sportsline. At 8 p.m., it's Talk Radio's Dr. Tony Grant, only on San Antonio's news station, KRNN.